I have a question for you. How can you tell if someone is lying? Ask them if they've heard of vans before, and if they say no, that's how you know they're lying. Even my grandma knows about vans. But all jokes aside, vans are everywhere. Go to any public place and there's a 100% chance you'll see someone rocking a pair of vans. Because in 2022, people of all ages and backgrounds wear vans. But it hasn't always been this way. Everyone from skateboarders to fashion forward uncles have integrated vans into their daily lifestyle. And even if you don't wear them or like them, you've for sure heard of them. In terms of popularity and relevance, Vans is up there with footwear giants like Nike and Converse. But what makes that so impressive is, Nike is 10 times as big and Converse is twice as old. Since their inception in 1966, the Van Doren Rubber Company, known today as simply Vans, has influenced American culture in a way many companies hope to, but never will, changing the world of skateboarding and shoes forever with their signature waffle sole. And what's insane is, they accomplished this focusing on just five classic styles. But to make matters even more impressive, in the 1980s, Vans nearly failed due to one fatal error in operations, an error which caused them to file Chapter 11 bankruptcy and rethink their entire business model. So what caused Vans to almost fail, and how did they save themselves to become the billion dollar company we know today? These days, wearing a pair of Vans is likely as mindless as throwing on a white t-shirt or tying your shoes. You don't even think about it because it's just become so standard in your life. That's the way I, and I'm sure many others view Vans in modern times. But let's go back to the early 2000s when that was far from the case. Once the 2000s rolled around, Vans realized they were in big trouble. Things were going okay financially, but they were starting to feel pressure from competitors such as DC and Osiris Shoes. Both companies, founded just years before in the mid-90s, preferred a chunkier technical design to the retro stylings associated with the Vans aesthetic. And as a result, Vans fell flat, came off as old, stale, and out of touch. At this point, they were running the risk of becoming irrelevant and knew something had to be done. But you know what, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. A giant shoe company doesn't just appear, someone has to start it. So in the 1940s, a young man named Paul Van Doren, fed up with high school, decided to drop out. At age 16, he began working at the Randolph Rubber Manufacturing Company, where canvas shoes were made. Here, he learned the basics of how shoes were manufactured and how to work with rubber, but at the time had no idea he'd go on to create one of the biggest shoe companies in the world. After working at Randolph for over 20 years, Paul and his brother James moved to Garden Grove, California, so they could help run a Randolph rubber factory out west. But the following year in 1965, they both left Randolph to start their own venture. The Van Doren Rubber Company opened its doors March 16, 1966, and from the start it was clear they were different. Instead of doing wholesale and dealing with retailers, James and Paul decided to cut out the middleman and sold their shoes directly to the public in order to increase profits. Men's shoes sold for $4.49 and women's shoes sold for $2.29. When someone came in and ordered a pair of shoes, the brothers would create them that day, then the customers could return that night and pick up their new shoes. But as cool as this unique ordering process was, it was the soul of Vans that made them truly special. And I mean literally the soul. When first starting out, Vans made their midsole twice as thick as their competitors, which provided increased durability. And when paired with the grippiness of their bottom waffle pattern, it took almost no time for skaters to take notice, and adopt Vans as their shoe of choice. By the mid-1970s, skateboarding was a genuine phenomenon, and Vans had the luck of being in the right place at the right time. But what it really came down to was recognizing how well their product could fit into the skateboarding community and seizing the opportunity. What I mean is, they did stuff like supplied free product to huge skate names like Tony Alva and Stacey Peralta. But they didn't stop there, they also drove them around in vans from skate spot to skate spot. So they drove them around in vans and gave them free vans to help grow their company called Vans. 
With the help of Alva and Peralta, Vans launched their Aeroshoe in 1976. It featured a padded collar and extra ankle protection, and skaters instantly fell in love with it. Vans felt like they'd finally found their niche after 10 years as a company. The old school came along in 1977, and then the skate high in 1978. Going into the 80s, Vans was bigger than they'd ever been, with a selection of outstanding skate shoes and skaters who wanted to skate them. But the 80s proved to be a turbulent time for Vans. They experienced their highest highs and lowest lows. On the high side of things, they gained almost instant worldwide recognition and adoration due to the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High, thanks to Sean Penn's over-the-top portrayal of character Jeff Spicoli, where he wore a pair of checkerboard slip-ons, and the shoes became iconic overnight. Within a few months of the movie's release, Vans doubled in size. They went from a $20 million company to a $45 million company in less than six months. However, following the success of Fast Times, Vans made arguably the worst decision they've ever made. Now, at twice the size, they felt comfortable trying to dominate other markets. But before we go any further, I need to ask you this. How would you feel if tomorrow, Vans dropped a football cleat? Because in my head, I'd be like, okay, so are they trying to be Nike now, or what? It would just feel wrong and inauthentic, which is the opposite of what Vans is known for. But in the 1980s, that's exactly what happened. Vans made skydiving shoes, volleyball shoes, breakdancing shoes, they really went for it. But as a result, overextended themselves. In 1984, just two years after doubling in size, Vans filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Swimming in over $12 million of debt, they began cutting costs everywhere they could think of, including notifying employees that they wouldn't receive a raise for three years. But somehow, against all odds, Vans emerged victorious in 1987, paying back every cent they owed. And they wasted no time getting back into the skate community with the release of Steve Caballero's signature high top shoe in the year 1988. But that same year, venture investment firm McCowan De Lewin Co. purchased Vans for a hefty $74 million. Paul, his brother, and their partners decided to use this as an opportunity to retire, marking a definite end to the Van Doren era of Vans. By the 1990s, things were once again looking up for Vans. With zero debt and a seemingly bright future, McCowan & Co. took them public just three years later, in 1991. They desired to re-establish Vans as the cornerstone of surfing, skating, and counterculture. And with their lucrative partnership with Warp Tour, which began in 1995, they were well on their way. On top of this, the 90s cultural obsession of all things skateboarding fueled their success through the 1990s. But that's not to say their growth through the 90s wasn't met with pitfalls and shortcomings, because it was. For example, in January 1995, Vans had to lay off 450 employees, and five months later closed their manufacturing facility in Orange County, California, moving even more of their production overseas and laying off another 1,000 employees. But they ended the 90s strong though. They were in a solid place financially, had a supreme collab under their belt, and purchased the triple crown of surfing. But as the early 2000s chugged along, Vans began to falter. They started focusing more on creating new styles, rather than staying true to the classics, and their bottom line began to reflect this. After a decade of success, it felt like for the first time in a while, they were starting to lose strength and momentum. Something they couldn't afford, not now, but at the same time, had no idea where to turn and didn't know what they were doing wrong. So they did something a lot of big companies do when they don't know what to do. They called in an expert. In 2002, footwear industry veteran Ryan Posibon received a call from Vans. Even though he was relatively new to the industry, Vans asked him and his friend John Warren to help rebuild the Vans brand from the ground up. And what's funny is, before Posibon was even officially hired, his first question was, will they let us mess with the classics? But even though it was a bold question, and probably not what Vans was expecting, because why would looking backwards be the answer, 
They said yes and let Pazibon do his thing, even though they weren't sure how it would go over. But the first collection he designed, in his words, was too technical, too experimental. There was like ventilation through the bottom. But that first collection he designed contained the key to Van's future success. Pazibon reworked a lot of the classic shapes and completely rebuilt some of them, trying his best to keep as close to the originals as possible. The new reworkings on the old shapes were only allowed to be sold to specialty stores, so they wouldn't end up in the backs of van stores or mass distributors. They basically positioned them in the coolest way they could, so they'd have the best chance of being perceived as cool. The following year in 2003, Vans released their Vault Collection, which served as a high-end take on the classic shapes, hoping to catch the attention of boutiques and influencers. After Posibon got Vans in the right direction and mindset for the future, another major factor came into play, something that would once again rock Vans' financial world, but in a good way this time. In 2004, Vans was acquired for $396 million in cash by North Carolina-based VF Corp, an American global apparel and footwear company founded in 1899. I'd never heard too much about them, but it turns out they own a ton of companies you've probably heard of, like the North Face, Timberland, and Supreme, to name a few. And while many acquisition stories tend to go the other way, as in bad, VF Corp and Vans have created a fruitful partnership over the years, with Vans becoming their biggest and fastest growing brand, generating billions of dollars in revenue. Post acquisition, Vans continued messing with the classics, with their slip on model really taking a cultural hold in the mid 2000s. And it seems like everyone's wearing old schools now more than ever. It seems at this point, they have their company, their customers, and even their future as a company down to an exact science. But I believe, when it comes to Vans, what really keeps people coming back is, people know they can count on them. They know they can keep coming back and Vans will stay true, but yet still continue to evolve and stay relevant, and classic, and authentic. That's why they'll always be the bread and butter of the skate community because of their commitment to authenticity. They understand that when it comes to creating new shoes and models, there has to be some lineage and ties to the shapes and patterns that exist in the classics. Otherwise, that lack of authenticity could kill them off for good, like they almost did to themselves in the 80s. I, and anyone who buys Vans, does so with the complete faith that Vans will never switch up on them. They'll be the same today, as tomorrow, as yesterday, but still evolve. And as a customer, I really don't know what more I could ask for. But what do you think? Is the rise of Vans really that impressive? Or am I just a Vans fanboy? And where do you think they'll be in 20 years? Let me know down in the comments below, and check out this next video. Thank you for watching.